Hello, it's over a month since I made my last video. I'm doing a series on this pamphlet, What is Land Value Taxation, which you can download from the website of the Land Value Tax Campaign. The website's just been revamped. It's a rather condensed leaflet, and it needs explaining, which is why I'm making these videos. And this one's been quite difficult, because it's needed quite a lot of thought which is why it's taken so long to prepare it. The leaflet says, Economic activities are handicapped by distance from the major centres of population. Conventional taxes, such as value-added tax, and those on transport fuels, cause particular damage to the remoter areas of the country. What do we mean by a marginal area? Some land can't be used for anything. Looks like this. This is Tindrum in the Scottish Highlands. It's said to be sub-marginal. There are some old forestry plantations put there by the old Nationalised Forestry Commission. But mostly it's bare. Here is what land looks like when it was once used for farming, but it's dropped below the margin. It was probably used to graze sheep. Now it's gone back to nature. Abandoned farmhouses are another thing that happens when farmland drops below the margin. In the southeast, it would have been a very desirable property. It's in North Wales. There's a mixture here of quite good grazing land, together with land which is thinly stocked with sheep, and land used for forestry, also probably planted by the Forestry Commission, or perhaps with the incentive of a grant or a tax concession. I guess it was planted in the first place to grow pit props for coal mines. And then they weren't needed because deep coal mining also became sub-marginal and they closed in the 1960s and 70s. So as far as I know, this piece of woodland is just used as a chute. Looking at the satellite picture, it's the Cluid Valley inland from Rill. You can see first higher pasture. But also that not much of the land is used for crops. One reason is transport costs. It's a long way from the nearest cities, Liverpool and Manchester. It's also very wet, which makes it good pasture. What a contrast then to the other side of the country, round Spalding in Lincolnshire, near the Wash, where most of the fields have had crops which had been harvested when the Google satellite picture was taken. This is farmland which is well above the margin. Judging by this shape of the fields, it looks as if they were created when the strip fields were enclosed at the end of the 18th century. Marginality is most easily observed as it affects what is known as primary production, which means farming and mining. These mines in Lee, Lancashire, were still working in the 1970s. This one on the edge of Newcastle was busy until the end of the 1960s. Now they've all gone, of course. But marginality is not just to do with agriculture, though Sunderland is not a good place for industry anymore. It was dying even when this picture was taken 50 years ago. Sunderland is just out on a limb. That's its disadvantage. I had a colleague who was a consultant for Nissan, but he was based where most of the automotive industry is located in the West Midlands which meant that he had to charge for six hours travelling whenever he visited the Sunderland factory. Marginality can easily be seen on any main road out of town. Let's have a look at this one here, near me on the way out of Gothenburg in Sweden. Hairdressers, takeaways, Thai massage, a gym, 
the filling station, paints and wallpapers, custom car parts, cigars, homebrew supplies, locks and security systems. And this one here has been empty for months, so they can't find a tenant at the price they want. This is typical of a marginal retail zone, local shops plus a few specialists to which customers will make a special journey, often from quite a long way away. So how does land value tax help marginal areas? A land value tax is the only tax where nothing is payable at the margin, because a marginal location is one where the value of land is low or next to nothing and the tax payable is proportional to the value of the land. Coming back to the leaflet, land value tax by definition bears lightly or not at all where land has little or no value, thereby stimulating economic activity away from the centre. It creates what are in effect tax havens exactly where they are most needed. Let's have a look at the model we used before to explain Ricardo's law, busking on the Victoria line on the London Underground. It made the assumption, it's obviously a crude one, that the amount the busker will collect is proportional to the number of passengers passing through the station. The model also makes the artificial assumption that the only pitches are the stations on the Victoria line is good enough to illustrate the point. The busiest station is King's Cross. Let's suppose the bus could take £60 in an hour, that's a pound a minute. If the pitch is occupied, our busker will hop on the train to the next best, Victoria, where the take is £50, which gives the King's Cross pitch a premium value of £10, that's the red square. This premium is what is called economic rent. When the first pitch is occupied, wages blue have dropped to £50 because the extra, that's the red now, is the advantage due to the better pitch. Let's continue. If Victoria is occupied, our busker can try Oxford Circus, where the take might be £40. Remember, this is just an illustration of a principle. Which then means that the King's Cross pitch is worth £20 in rent and Victoria £10, and wages have dropped to £40. The areas coloured red represent rent. We can continue like this for a bit longer. There's Euston, which brings in £30, and then the rental values of all the other pitches go up by another £10, and wages fall by the same amount. At Seven Sisters, the busker takes £20, and at Pimlico, just £10. Each new arrival who takes up the best pitch available makes the wages on all the other pitches drop, and the rents go up. Now we come to the critical point. It isn't worth busking for less than £10. Why not? There's a bottom limit, which is fixed, when it's easier to make the same amount, by doing something else. So we can say that Pimlico is the marginal site. Busking at Black Horse Road isn't worth the effort. It's sub-marginal, so we can ignore it. And now we end up like this. It shows, in case we didn't know, that equal amounts of effort, in this case an hour's busking, do not yield the same amount of value. The true wage now is £10. Everything above that, all those areas of red, represent rent. And this incidentally refutes Marx's labour theory of value. His economics ignore the effects of location on productivity. They ignore rent. Now look at the effect of taking 20% in tax, a flat tax. It doesn't sound like a lot. But even so, it's pushed Pimlico below the £10 figure, which means that it's no longer worth busking at Pimlico. Pimlico has become sub-marginal. The tax charge has knocked the site out of use. And that is the most important argument 
against the flat tax. This principle applies at every scale of the economy. There are vast tracts of the country where economic activity would be viable if it wasn't for tax. We can also see that these areas would not be liable for tax under a system of land value taxation and in that condition you end up with optimum production. There is no what they call dead weight loss due to taxation. It's the optimum state of affairs. Any tax, whether it's a sales tax or uh, income taxes or profits taxes or a property tax which attempts to take more than the rental value of the land, the underlying land, makes economic activity on that site non-viable in the long run. It can go on for a while but eventually it dies. The only tax which does not have this damaging effect is a tax on the rental value of the land alone. I'll repeat that. The only tax which does not knock out economic activity at marginal locations is a tax which falls on the rental value of land alone.